also here. We're getting a, a lot of the storm right now. Plenty of rain, a lot of wind, and that means a lot of people calling for help, but unfortunately, they're unable to get it at this time, yeah, which a, was warned about. It's a developing problem uh, happening right now in the city of Miami, and we have Captain Ignatius Carroll with Miami Fire Rescue joining us now uh, on the phone. Thanks for uh, calling us uh, and letting us know about this problem. So how are you guys going to handle this? People trying to get help, and it's not coming their way. Right, but we're uh, trying to uh, let a lot of people that are calling 911 know it, that it's going to be very difficult for us to respond out there with a lot of debris that's out along the streets. So what we're doing is only uh, responding to true emergencies that uh, we know that can be considered life or death. So the big issue is, is that debris, uh, so it's just too dangerous for uh, officers and, and first responders to get out there on the roads? Right, and that's one of the reasons why having that curfew in effect is because it's too dangerous for people driving around. But we want to really uh, uh, let people know out there is that when they call 911, they can't expect a, a three or four minute response time. We have to use discretion. Uh, when the feeder bands are not as strong as they are, then we're able to respond out there, but that's at the discretion of the fire trucks. But um, we want people also to be mindful that uh, these winds are very dangerous and they pose a threat to first responders. And Captain, this is something that we had talked about leading up to feeling the impacts of Irma all week long. Multiple agencies were stressing the fact that once the wind speeds reached a certain point, they would not be able to respond to calls. We're, we're relieved that you are still trying to make your way out there for those life and death calls. But um, for, for people who, who are something happened and they're thinking, oh, I'll call 911 just in case, what are the types of issues that you just really cannot handle right now? Well, what we're doing is that uh, for your regular medical emergencies, you know, uh, stomach ache, I cut my finger, we're asking them to kind of uh, render that first aid themselves at home. But, uh, you, you know, you can't help it if there's a fire. But we are seeing that some people are calling for uh, a fire at a home, and it's really um, electrical lines that are sparking. And some people think that the fire department is going to respond out there and be able to mitigate that problem. That's something that's handled at by FPNL, and it's dangerous for them to come out. So we're asking people to understand that you can let us know what's going on, and as soon as we're able to get out there and, and handle that situation, then they will get out there. What's your staff looking like right now? How many uh, fire rescue uh, officials and trucks do you have uh, at the disposal of the community uh, to answer those calls that really do need to be answered? Well, what we have is the, besides the normal staffing of the fire stations, we've staffed our additional spare trucks with personnel as well as our special response teams so that uh, we know that there's going to be numerous calls that are going to be coming in. So we have also life safety teams that are spread out throughout the city that are able to respond out to assess damage areas once the storm has passed because the most important thing that we all need to do uh, is to make sure that the streets are cleared so that you're able to respond. And just as people get uh, debris in the front of their house, that makes it very difficult for them to get out. Same thing happens with uh, fire stations as well. So it makes it very difficult. So that's why we need the community to understand the challenges that first responders, and that's being police and fire, have to face when they're calling 911. We want to get to them as quickly as possible, but we need them to understand the circumstances that we're dealing with. We know all these first responders do what they do because they truly love their communities. They feel a sense of, of urgency to, to help these people. So talk about, just on a personal level, how frustrating is it to be getting 911 calls that you cannot answer? Oh, uh, you can imagine, with the, uh, starting with the dispatchers who uh, take those calls, you know, they want to be able to send help as quickly as possible to everyone. But uh, it's challenging to be able to... Uh, to decipher which one is considered a true emergency and which one is not. And we have some that are true emergencies, and we have some that people are like, well, I want them to get out here, so I'm going to um, exaggerate the emergency. So we, we're asking people not to do that, okay, because you're putting your first responders in harm's way when you're trying to get them to come out for something that's not a true emergency. Not right. only that, but are, are they also breaking the law by doing that? By, is, is it almost like a filing of a false report? Um, you know, it's kind of hard to tell if that's what the case is because they can exaggerate something from a cut to a house fire. But, you know, sometimes we have people who don't know any better and you have some that are actually, you know, just trying to get a response out there. But it doesn't make a difference of what type of incident. Electrical issues have to be handled by 
the appropriate agency. They can't come out there and get up there to those lines when the, the, the wind gusts are 50 plus miles an hour. Um, obviously, when dispatchers receive these calls, they, there's a log and they keep track of every call that comes in and, and what these people are calling about. Will you guys be able to perhaps revisit that log, some of those lower priority calls? Will you revisit and possibly go out to them or will these people need to, to call again if they really do need the help when, when help can actually be made available? Yes, what we actually do is that with the caller on the phone, we are talking to the stations to have them go out and take a look and see the conditions. Some areas may uh, be uh, less windier than uh, in another area. So what we do is we have them brought there and they assess that situation and see whether or not it's safe for them to respond. And if not, then we're, we're doing our best to at least give some type of instructions that they can do to maintain stability of that person until we're able to get out there. But we have a lot of residents that do understand the circumstances and trying to take care of it themselves. But that's why all the safety tips are given prior to these storms uh, coming about. Stay off the streets. Try not to do anything in your house that you could get hurt that would require medical attention and understand that medical attention can't come in that four to six minute response time. Sure. And, and for those calls that you're not responding to, what kind of training uh, do the people who, who are assisting them over the phone have? Are, are these the 911 operators or are these are they connecting them uh, to, uh, to first responders to kind of walk them through what they need to do? No, this is your 911 dispatchers who, uh, anytime you call 911, they are highly trained to, to, to mitigate any incident, to give you the proper instructions. Uh, they're basically um, helping us. They're helping you by helping us by giving you those, those instructions. So if you're in your 911 dispatchers. Okay, I think it's important to know that, that people at home uh, know that the person on the phone knows what they're talking about. Yeah. So they can help remedy the issue, and that way you don't have to put uh, the other first responders uh, at risk by having them drive out in these uh, conditions. But if it is a, a severe emergency, they will come out there and, and help you out. And, Captain, very quickly about those, uh, I believe you said it was two incidents that you were going to try to respond to or that you already did respond to because they, it's life and death. Uh, related to the storm in any way, was this someone who perhaps got hurt, was outside, anything related? to that? I'm not sure of the actual circumstances, how it happened, but we do know that sometimes some people tend to do things in their homes. But like I said, it's best that during a storm, uh, we're in a hurricane mode. Don't do anything that has the potential for you getting hurt. Uh, we actually just to stay calm, you know, watch the storm. Obviously, watch the news so you, you have a constant updates. But uh, heed the warnings that are being given to you by all your first responding agencies. All right, and Captain, one more thing, because we're about to go into those power outage numbers. And when the power goes out, a lot of people turn on those generators. Some quick tips for people, because uh, sometimes they could be unsafe. And I know the fire department is always urging a lot of caution when, when those generators kick in. Right, definitely generators. Obviously, uh, the safe thing to do is obviously keep it away from the house. You don't want to operate it inside the house. Uh, make sure that uh, you have already started it, that, that it's working properly. If it's not working properly, then you do better not using it at all. But, um, you know, just good safety tips. Keep your gas containers away from it when it's running. But the most important thing is to not have it near the house because the, the fumes that in, can get inside the house, and that's where we get a lot of our carbon monoxide calls. And, and to that point and the cause of that, the, the power outages and the drop power lines, can you reiterate again the, sa the safety issues with people who are going out there to explore the damage? Perhaps they'll do that in a few hours when the sun comes up, but there might be those down power lines. What do you do if you come across something like that? Uh, well, we're encouraging people not to, to go outside until, you know, you have uh, agencies responding out there to make sure that everything is safe. If you are going out there and you see a down power line, then you need to, you can call 911. There's a number that I'm sure is going to be given by FNL for a hotline. But uh, call 911 to let us know. Make sure that you keep your family members away and you stay away and also be mindful of the standing water around you. All right, Captain Ignatius Carroll with Miami Fire Rescue. Thank you and uh, good luck to you. I know you guys want to get out there as soon as possible. Right, right now, though, it's just too dangerous for them uh, to go out there for calls that are not uh, of a certain level. And as soon as they can get out there, I know they will. So uh, we appreciate you sharing that information with us. Thanks again. And, uh, thank you guys very much. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And